Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for the invite. Uh, most importantly, uh, both Rajiv and uh, Shalini for the invite. So uh, I will share my screen and we'll see how that all works out. So hopefully, yeah, you can see it. Yep. Yes. Okay. I'll, yep. Let me put it into the mode. Okay. So I've been to also talk about adjuvant therapy in type 1 diabetes. And I think this is a very interesting topic uh, because we obviously, over the course of time, we have always talked about well, type 1 diabetes insulin, but we all see patients and we score, which you go and like, well, is it just this? Will the insulin only do it or can we do something else? So what do we have? We have risks associated with type 1 diabetes nowadays. You know, incidence of obesity is rising. And if you look at all the data sets, it is similarly uh, at par in the sense that obesity itself is a risk factor in type 1 diabetes. People are living longer with type 1 diabetes. That continues to be an issue. What are the limitations of insulin therapy? Even though it's something that obviously saves lives, there's suboptimal dosing of insulin that can occur due to fears of hypoglycemia. People not taking enough of their insulin can lead to DKA. You can have variability of blood glucose levels because similar doses of insulin can lead to different unpredictable responses. We know that. We see that from our patients. And people may feel they're not in control of their diabetes in spite of everything they're doing. And we can see that it doesn't matter what device you use. And all the insulin companies are working to try and make the, uh, an insulin more modern, more sort of flexible. But the problems stay. Now, what is the purpose of adjunct therapies? What are, what are we trying? Adjunct therapies being something you want to use in addition to insulin. You want more stable glucose profiles. You love to have less hypoglycemia, less weight gain. And what it isn't, and that's quite important, that it's not replacing insulin. So I think we need to be very clear that insulin still is a life-saving drug in that. And we're not trying to decrease insulin dose. It might happen, but it's not aimed at that. It's definitely not replacing insulin either. So what do we have? Let's look at some of the evidence base. We've got metformin. Now, if you look at metformin, people do try metformin to use, and I have personally tried a lot of it, which is geared at trying to see whether that will help in, you know, reducing or, you know, improving insulin sensitivity. If you look at, however, these trials, the removal trial, if you look at it, there isn't a really a huge improvement in glycemic control, according to this particular trial after the first three months, not approved in the United States. And they also looked at progression of atherosclerosis, um, but other cardiovascular risk factors such as body weight did improve, LDL cholesterol improved, but progression of atherosclerosis wasn't there, glycemic control wasn't there. So that's the summary of metformin. What about this particular drug, which is, is in the States, your pramlinotide, that it's a metanalysis in type 1 diabetes. They assess the efficacy and safety results of 10 RCTs where they were given pramlinotide. They increased the incidence of nausea uh, but, uh, and vomiting, but hb one reduction was there. So there is a benefit, but with associated side effects with pramlinotide. What is it? It's an injectable amylin analog. It delays gastric emptying, it blunts pancreatic glucagon secretions, uh, improves satiety. So it does have its role, but three injections needed per day. So you're adding on top of the insulin that's there. Adverse events, as I said, according to the trials, available in the United States, not in the European Union. So one more adjunct therapy, which people have. Again, there's a lot of injection burden, side effects, but it does improve HbA1c. What about GLP-1? Well, this is the adjunct 1 study. If you look at liraglutide and HbA1c, you can see the difference that it does make. So if you add it in, you can look at the different doses of lira, whether it's 1.8, 1.2, 0.6. They all have benefits. And it's significantly larger for liter glucose 1.8 and 1.2 milligram compared with placebo. So if that's in type 1 diabetes, if you add it on, it does seem to have a benefit. What about glyphlosin? So SGLT2 inhibitors. So here is something where it becomes more interesting. And so tandem two was the study using sotagliflozin, double-blinded 52-week uh, trial, type 1 diabetes given placebo or oral sotagliflozin. And different doses, as you can see, six weeks of insulin optimization. You can see the change in HbA1c from baseline, which is 7.8, dropped by point, nearly 0.4 or 0.35. And differences were maintained at 52 weeks. So it does improve the glycemic level. Greater proportions of uh, people on sotagliflozin met the endpoint. So reduced fasting plasma glucose, reduced weight, and reduced insulin dose. We did, did a lot of positives. So if I summarize that, HbA1c improved, fasting plasma glucose improved, weight improved, 
total daily dose uh, also dropped down. So that was the Tandem 2 study. Then you look at this one, which was the Depict 1. So you have different studies. And so just to sort of go back one, you have the Metformin, which was a removal study, then the Pramilinotide. You have the GLP-1 study. And then you've got these, this is the gliflozin. So we started with sotagliflozin. This is uh, with dapagliflozin, where they showed it with uh, Depict a study. And again, if you see the impact of the dapagliflozin being added on, you can see that at 5 and 10 milligram, there is a definite drop in the HbA1c. So it does absolutely make a difference as from the HbA1c standpoint. But what is the risk? So there is a risk with SGL2 inhibitors, which is always talked about. I mean, SGL2 inhibitors, DK is a risk of insulin therapy, which some studies would suggest uh, may be increased by SGL2 inhibitors. Obviously, very widely used right now, type 2 diabetes, heart failure, beyond diabetes. But in type 1 diabetes, where insulin is the mainstay, there is some suggestion that the, some of the risks may be increased in the background. So if, however, there are different, different studies out there. There is this very small study done with 10 patients only, where Patel and colleagues did the study, and they said that it did not accelerate the ketogenosis. So, and I'll talk a little bit of my own anecdotal experience, because I do use SGLD2 sparingly. Uh, it's been presumed that Elevated blood glucose may be a warning sign of eminent DKA, but then again, DKA may occur in patients with blood glucose in euglycemic range. So it's quite difficult to sort of tease out, which is what we do see uh, in, in patients with type 1 diabetes using SGLD2 inhibitors. What do we do to manage the risk? Well, what do I do? So I pretty much follow this one. You will ensure that, you know, you want patients quite switched on. They're aware of that this is a drug which could improve their A1C and weight and everything, but it does come with a high risk of them going into DKA. So important ketone monitoring, extremely important. You need to use the lowest dose possible to achieve the clinical benefit. Uh, consider reducing the insulin dose because the background insulin does seem to predispose towards more DKA. So that's what we do suggest. And advise that DKA can occur even if blood glucose is normal or slightly elevated. So I think ketone checking is very important going forward in this particular group. We keep on saying this to people. Again, avoid prescribing SGL inhibitors for poorly compliant people. And I think we say that word in the sense that I think if you're worried about the patient's compliance factor, whether they will take the insulin, don't use it just because, oh, HPNC is really high. So let's just give it. I wouldn't because I would be really worried about what they're doing. So they've got a history of DKA, high HPA ones. We tend to avoid it. So it's much more of the lower levels we try when we're trying to see if we can help with a little bit with the body weight side of things. Low carb diets is advised to avoid simply because it becomes more ketogenic. Now we tend to avoid, there's no evidence one way or the other, but what I think we do tend to go on the side of caution of saying, if you're a diet which automatically will create more ketones in the system, and if you're going to use another product, which is also going to do that, that might become like complementary with each other. So just be careful on that sort of side of things. Uh, lab testing, still the most precious method for assessing ketones, but the ketone meter education is fundamental to using SGLT2 inhibitors if you do use them in type 1 diabetes. And of course, you provide a blood ketone meter in addition to the glucose monitor to everybody. Here is a protocol that was done by Chantal Matthew and our group. It's called the STITCH protocol, which we do use a lot in when we, to the patients, we do tend to give out these particular products too. So what it is, you know, if you do have higher ketones, we ask them to stop the SGL2 inhibitor, ask them to inject some bolus insulin, consume 30 grams of carbohydrates and drink a lot. So that's a protocol we, we use quite a lot in local systems. Especially now, we mu I must say that dapagliflozin, which was created, which was uh, under the banner of AstraZeneca, uh, that had a license for type one diabetes, but has now been withdrawn. So it doesn't have the license as an off-license prescription, as is now every one of them. So we talked about SGLT2 inhibitors, we talked about GLP ones, but they're all very much used in an off-license capacity at the present moment of time. So we do have all these products and they have some evidence, but they come with a sort of background of side effects and worry, but at the same time does benefit some people if you can pick the right patient. It's not a, not a medication that we use for everybody. Now, this particular slide I've deliberately put up and I, I like the summary of this slide that's there because it opens it up for good conversations with people. And I use that with a lot of patients 
in a more simplified version when people say, what else can I use? Or patients will come to you and say, I read about this and what should I do? Now, for us in a continuous professional development role that we are as diabetologists, I always look at this and I like it because it talks about, well, what what is the evidence? So let's take it from the top. You've got metformin. Uh, it's got really optimal effects on blood, body weight, lipid concentrations, and insulin dose. The effect on H balance is not sustainable over time. That's the removal study. It's got some benefits, but not a huge amount. It feels like people who have got high degrees of background obesity, would it work? It's hit and miss. In my experience, I have used quite a fair bit of metformin. We tend to move away from metformin because it doesn't work. Then we, we try different things in the background. I must stress again, is DPP, uh, again, it's unlicensed. Uh, DPP-4 inhibitors has been used, potential role, good safety profile, not really much impact anyway on HP and co weight, so I tend to avoid. GLP-1 analogs I do use, and it says about significant reductions in HP and c body weight and insulin. That's borne out by all the studies that have been done, whether it's the liraglutide or any of the studies that you've seen, some good evidence of doing that. But it does come with higher risk of hypo. Now, this particular paper states DK. I haven't had personally any DK risks. Uh, hypoglycemia, yes, because you, and we talk about the insulin adjustment, especially the basal insulin, but we have got patients on weekly GLP-1s along on the background of the type 1 diabetes because of a higher body weight or obesity, and they do seem to like it, and it does seem to help with their overall control. If also they're on some monitors, glucose monitors, um, then you can actually see the impact it has on the baseline. Uh, so that's quite interesting to use. Then you've got amylin, which is not licensed in Europe, where we are, but it's licensed in the uh, States. I've got a fair few colleagues who we have discussed this about. I think the draw, it does work, HbA1c body weight, but it does have a significant amount of side effects as well. And it does need to be administered a number of times along with the insulin. So. I think with somebody who's quite happy and willing to take on a lot of the injection burdens, et cetera, then it's worthwhile thinking about it. I'll come back to SGLD2 inhibitors, so I'll skip that for a minute. Thiazolidindiones, again, it's their weight gain. Thiazolidindiones, in general, have moved out of practice across the board in diabetes, so that's not surprising the same in type 1 either because of the weight gain side of things. And in most of these patients, we talk about the junk therapy because we want to tackle the weight, and again, Going back to the right to the beginning point, which I said, weight and growing weight and obesity is a ma major, major problem in a type 1 diabetes at the present moment, even though it instinctively doesn't feel right. So if you look at the national diabetes order that we have done in the UK, and that's across the whole population, if you want to pick out independent risk factors, obesity actually is one linked to type 1, worsening HbA1c with body weight. It's very clear data across all age groups. And SGL is in the end, because there's a lot of chatter, lots of excitement about it. It was there, then it's been withdrawn. And I've got a several number of patients on it. But again, I must reemphasize the point, it works really well, but it's not for everybody. It does carry a high risk and it absolutely needs to be done with very clear picking of the patients. And that's my own experience, I'm sort of saying, and what you'd like to do. So that's where we are with all the adjunct therapies. And I think it would be wrong not to finish this talk by talking the most important adjunct therapy in the mix, which is diet. So people talk about, you know, what is the relevance of diet? So I think there is a there is sometimes a misconception, and, we, and I think it gets uh, stuck in wrong debate pops, if that makes sense, where people go like, well, if I've got type 1, we can eat everything. I think the narrative is that you should eat as healthily as the rest of the population. It's not like we're stopping you from eating anything. I think that's an important narrative. And there's a big conversation about well, what is the role of low carbs, for example, in type 1 diabetes. There is no problem. Low carbs do work well, uh, as do low calories in type 1 diabetes or any form of diabetes. The, the fundamental of that is sustainability and whether the patient's motivated and whether they can afford to sort of continue with that particular diet. That's the key to it, not the actual nuance of the diet itself. The only thing I would say is that if they're on a very low carb diet or in ketogenic diet, be careful if you're using an SGLG2 inhibitors because of the risk of ketones. So that's pretty much, I think, a run through of everything adjunct that's there uh, with type 1 diabetes. And again, as I said, to uh, I pretty much use uh, use metformin, use GLP-1, I use SGLG2 inhibitors or from that list. I don't use DPP-4. Amylin's not in use in the UK and I don't use thiazol or lindions. So that's the sort of mixture of things that we do tend to use. So I'll, I'll wrap up there and some little conclusions. Again, just sort of summarizing what I did say, you know, the right balance needs to be found when you're going there. So they're promising, but you need to pick your patients as you go forwards. I'll finish there. Thank you very much.